Secretary Aldright, Professor Gambari, Mayor of Anatsen, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this morning's launch of the report of the Commission on Global Security, Justice and Governance. As we consider how to build a world that is more just, more secure and better governed, there could be no more fitting venue than the Peace Palace, an edifice which serves as a global symbol of international law, as well as the seat of its practice. After over a year of commission meetings, consultations, e-discussions, research and writing, it is truly an honor to open this morning's proceedings and to introduce our commissioners. The commission, which is co-chaired by Secretary Albright and Professor Gambari, is a joint initiative of the Hague Institute for Global Justice and the Stimson Center, represented today by its president, Ellen Lipson. It has been a privilege this last year to work with such an esteemed group, as well as to benefit from the insights and expertise of the many individual experts and policymakers who have contributed to this effort. I am delighted, moreover, that the founding father of our own institute, Mayor Van Atzen, has also served as a member of the Commission, and that he is here to welcome us to the international city of peace and justice this morning. We are also pleased to welcome to The Hague our Commissioner from Germany, Dr. Michael Schaefer, who has offered key insights on global institutional reform in preparation of the Commission's report. The mission of the Hague Institute is to undertake policy-relevant research, convene experts, and train practitioners on issues at the critical intersection of peace, security, and justice. In so doing, we unite scholarship and practice to improve outcomes and ultimately to strengthen global justice. Our support of this commission is designed to do exactly that. Through dialogue with eminent scholars, old UN hands, and inspirational young people, we've provided a platform for debate, both online and offline, on the future of the global governance architecture, focusing on three key cases where we believe the time for reform is ripe. State fragility and violent conflict, climate and people, and the hyper-connected global economy. Efforts to go beyond the status quo on these issues could not be more timely. Not only do we face pressing global challenges beyond the control of any single state, but this, the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, also provides us with a unique opportunity to rally a constituency for change. In this moment full of promise, it is our aim to ensure that proposed changes to development cooperation, peace operations, peace building, and climate change policies are joined together by effective reform of the global governance architecture itself. The recommendations you will hear today on these subjects marry far-sightedness with political reality. They are grounded not only in an appreciation of cutting-edge scholarship, but also in a deep understanding of how change happens at the global level. The Commission's proposals also emphasize areas at the intersection of security and justice in global governance. They show an appreciation of the inevitable tensions between these fundamental concepts, but go on to identify new opportunities where global security and justice can be mutually reinforcing. It is our hope that the recommendations of the report will resonate with many of you, and that you will join us in our mission to build an international system fit for purpose in the 21st century. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce someone without whom today's event would not have been possible. Certainly, without Mayor Josias Van Atzen, there would have been no Hague Institute for Global Justice. And I venture to say the dynamic interplay between the unique constellation of institutions in The Hague would not be nearly so advanced. It is a privilege to work closely with the mayor in support of his efforts to make The Hague universally renowned as the international city of peace and justice. And I am grateful for his support, both for The Hague Institute and for the commission on which he has served as a member. Mayor Van Artsen, and now, I now invite you to say a few words. Well, Your Excellencies, Secretary Albright, as a frequent visitor to uh, The Hague, Ambassador uh, Gambari, Mr. Williams, uh, Grootmeester S, and uh, President of the Board of the De Hague Institute, uh, Dick Benschop. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to De Hague, um, the city which has the honor to, uh, of hosting this commission. At the initiative of the De Hague Institute of uh, Global Justice and the Stimson Center, warm welcome to you as well, and Lipson. The Commission has sought to address several serious global challenges, settling the point where justice and security intersect. And this report touches on a number of vital uh, issues, vital issues which are at the core of the, the Hague's mission as a UN city and of our national constitu constitution mandate to promote the development of the international legal order. First as the host, for the Hague, first as the host of a number of international courts and tribunals, the Hague cares deeply, as they know, for these institutions. And it therefore pleases us that the Commission has agreed on a number of recommendations strengthening these institutions. These include harnessing the conflict prevention and peace building roles of the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. To date, only a third of, about a third of UN member states recognize the World Court's jurisdiction as compulsory. And in an international system to be based on the rule of law, on the right instead of might, this cannot stand. At the same time, the international community should make fuller use of the ICJ's advisory jurisdiction using to, solic to solicit authoritative legal rulings on the most pressing challenges of our time. I would also like to uh, highlight the report's recommendations on improving safe and free access to internet in the global south. The internet is an essential tool to take part in today's hyper-connected economy, as the report says, and in our emerging global society. However, it also creates, as we know, risks, for instance, in the form of cyber attacks by criminals or even by states, as we know now. Recognizing the importance of these issues, the Hague hosted the Global Conference on Cyber Security in April this year. And the present report builds on the issues discussed at that conference. The Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, to be established here in The Hague, which was launched at the Global Conference with the support of more than 42 governments, intergovernmental organizations and companies, is an important step in fighting cyber and, and in promoting cybersecurity and fighting cybercrime. The Peace Palace Library 
holds the first edition of Hugo Grotius' world-famous Mare Liberum, on the freedom of the, of the seas written here in the city more than 400 years ago. And in not too dust distant future, the library might just hold a summary seminal contribution on the freedom, security, and openness of the vast ocean that is cyber, the cyberspace. More broadly, the issues addressed by the Commission also reflect another important insight, that you cannot divide current global challenges into those that can be fixed ex exclusively in The Hague, for instance, with a judgment, and those that can be fixed exclusively in New York, for example, with the Security Council resolution. We need to put justice and security into a mutually reinforcing relationship and bridge the conceptual divide between what The Hague as the global capital of justice and New York as home of the UN Security Council represent. Security and justice are just two sides of the same coin of better, more effective, accountable and equitable global governments and translate this insight into politics. There are many more interesting recommendations in uh, the report strengthening the United Nations. In fact, the program for the election, I think, uh, of the Netherlands for the non-permanent seat of the Security Council in 17 and, uh, and 18. And even if you can believe the report re-election after that, but that will be a debatable uh, issue without, uh, without uh, any, any doubt. And apart from strengthening the United Nations, there is the interesting idea uh, of participation, but then real participation and doing what you write down of women in peacekeeping operations. But certainly, not least, the report stresses the importance of more players into the international uh, field, bringing cities as well into the issue of global governance. We has dis have discussed it in a panel, Secretary Albright, you and I, together in Chicago a fortnight uh, ago. In less than, well, let's say 40 years' time, roughly three quarters of the world's population will live in cities and metropolitan areas. Increasingly, cities are called to play a pivotal role in bridging local and international responses to major global challenges, such as migration, climate change, integrating cities into global governments and fostering coordination at different institutional levels is a necessary step in maximizing the effectiveness, effectiveness of global policies and their social relevance. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this year sees the 70th anniversary of the United Nations. We're approaching 70. And in the past seven uh, decades, we have witnessed unparalleled human achievements. But at the same time, as we all know in this hall, we face a growing range of new global and interconnected problems. At the Peace Palace centenary celebrations, and at the presentation of the De Hague approach of the Institute, I, I asked myself to what extent are our present societies and the international system shock resistant? The challenges, the challenges that we face today are more complex than ever and they exceed the operational and political capacities of global governance institutions that were created in another in a different time. Notwithstanding the complexity of the matters addressed in this report, the Commission focused on a simple truth. Without security, there cannot be justice, and without justice, there can't be security. And this reminded me of the words spoken by Benjamin Ferenc, the judge at the Nuremberg Tribunal, where he said, and I quote, there can be no peace without justice, end of quote. And one of the mosaic flaws here in the uh, Peace Palace bears the Latin inscription, Sol Justitiae Illustra Nos, Son of Justice, illuminate us. And I hope that this report will contribute towards this sun also illuminating every 
even in the most remote area of our world and bring it peace, justice and security. Thank you. Mayor Van Aksen, thank you for those insights and for all you've done to support the cause of peace and justice as a member of the Commission, the founding father of the Hague Institute, and in your ongoing work as mayor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before we hear from our commissioners, it is my pleasure to introduce our partner in this endeavor, the president of the Stimson Center, Ellen Lipson. The cooperation between the Hague Institute and the Stimson Center represents a meeting of minds though we each have our areas of principal expertise for the Hague Institute, justice, for Stimson, security. In that sense, the partnership was a natural one, and I'm delighted that it has prospered over the course of this endeavor under Ellen's able leadership. Ellen, I invite you to say a few words and to introduce our co-chairs. Uh, thank you, Abby and uh, Mr. Mayor and all the distinguished guests. It's really a great privilege for Stimson, a Washington think tank, to be represented as a co-sponsor of this important commission report. Uh, I thought I'd say a word about Stimson. We're a 25-year-old think tank that looks at the enduring and the emerging problems of international security. Our work has spanned the agenda from nuclear weapons to climate change, and the various effects of globalization. We do take security as a very inclusive concept. We're not just looking at security for nation states, but we're interested in security at the human and societal level, as well as the governance processes that try to address security problems at all these different levels, national, regional, and global. As Abby said, the partnership between Stimson and the Hague Institute really underscores one of the premises of our report, which is that we live in very specialized communities, but most of the problems of international security in the 21st century really require a more integrated approach. We were well aware from the work that my colleague Bill Dirch and others have done on how to restore peace in conflict-ridden areas that if the justice peace isn't very carefully attended to in that immediate post-conflict period, the security is really ephemeral. The security cannot endure unless the justice mechanisms and architecture are in place. So both of our organizations very much embrace this idea that security and justice are intertwined and equally valid and important parts of how you build peace and security. So it was really natural for our two organizations, both relatively young, relatively small organizations, uh, to work together to try to think more holistically about how in global governance and international processes of problem solving need to pay more attention to the interplay between security and justice. It's too easy to say that every problem in the world, whether it's international migration or worrying about terrorists acquiring uh, illicit materials of weapons of mass destruction, it's too easy to say that every issue is complicated. We have to somehow get over that concept of, of everything's too complicated and find newer and smarter and more agile ways to bring the right people together to problem solve. So we're very interested in bridging between communities of experts, trying to um, make sure that we are engaging people who can pool their knowledge, who can pool their different disciplines and perspectives into smarter solutions. Um, if you look at our report, there's many, many ideas in the report. There's a long list of recommendations, uh, very carefully bro broken into different topics. But I wanted to spend a, a minute or two on what are the goals of our report. We have under no illusion that every single recommendation will be embraced very quickly, but what we're really trying to do is be part of a global conversation of both citizens and officials in grappling together with how to improve the mechanisms, not just the formal institutions of global governance, but the other ways in which consensus is built 
and bright ideas come to the surface. So we hope our report will contribute in a very lasting and ongoing way uh, to a generation of smart ideas, whether it's students or young people working in NGOs or people who are working in uh, UN operations around the world, as well as the, the bureaucrats who sit in big buildings. We want to be part, we want to generate some ideas and some fresh thinking um, in these conversations that have to happen to build consensus for processes of reform. So we're as interested in how to think about smarter ways of doing business than the particular mechanical fixes to the system that we are proposing. And as others have, have said, we're not interested just in the UN itself as an institution, but we're interested in how the UN engages with other interested actors and how we make uh, a, network, a more networked approach to solving problems of global governance. Um, we don't expect a radical transformation of the international system. That's not one of the assumptions of our report, that we can somehow in the 21st century start all over and reinvent the international system. But we are looking for achievable, incremental improvements in how these institutions and processes work. Um, and so we want very much to be part of, we are also very inclusive and friendly towards other uh, institutional reports and conversations that are taking place. We want to add our voice and welcome the voices of others. We are already in contact with other institutions that are, are uh, struggling with some of these same ideas and hope that together we create a community of, of concerned citizens that can generate some smart new ideas. It's my, really my great pleasure to introduce our co-chairs. These are two remarkable people who have been such prominent statesmen as we transition from the 20th to the 21st century. They have both served in uh, very senior official positions in their governments. In the case of uh, Professor Gambari, he was also an undersecretary of the UN, as well as both foreign minister and UN ambassador of Nigeria. Uh, they've both been university professors. They even knew each other in graduate school at Columbia University. Um, but most importantly to me is they know the UN system well, its strengths and its limitations. And in their uh, lives after being officials, they have been such wise and lively um, contributors to global conversations about how to make the world a more uh, peaceful place. Um, they both have demonstrated enormous uh, passion and commitment and dedication to continuing a kind of public service life even after they are no longer representing uh, governments. Um, I had the honor of working for Madeleine Albright when she was ambassador to the UN in the mid-90s at a time when the international system really was changing. We were still adjusting to the end of the Cold War and taking really more forceful positions on issues like human rights and um, how to build post-conflict societies. And her role in bringing both American attention and global attention to the crisis the human rights dimensions of the crisis in the Balkans, I think, will go down in the history books as an important transition in how global governance works. Um, so we were working at the UN at that time at a period of another period when there was state failure, Haiti, the Balkans, the African Great Lakes Wars, etc. And so they have both accumulated enormous uh, wisdom and experience about what is achievable and how can one build consensus and move forward. They have both been uh, beloved teachers, uh, political activists, and statesmen. Um, they are uh, greatly in demand, and so uh, Abby Williams and I were so pleased that they both agreed to contribute in such important ways to our commission. They stayed involved um, very intensely in the development of this report. We were lucky to actually finish it on time and in one year from start to finish. And I know they want to share with you some of the findings and the ideas that they care most about in this very uh, broad and comprehensive study. So it's my great privilege to first introduce you to uh, Secretary Albright. Thank you very much, Ellen, and to the uh, heads of courts and international agencies and uh, members of the ambassadorial corps and 
um, members of the Dutch Parliament and Government, and my fellow commissioners, uh, uh, Mayor Van Artsen and distant, uh, <coughs> Dr. Schaefer and distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be back in The Hague. I have come here many, many times. I would especially like to thank Mayor Van Artsen, who is a remarkable leader in The Hague, but has been a remarkable international leader. We became very good friends when we were both foreign ministers. We continue to do many things together. Um, and when he said that he wanted to make sure that um, The Hague was viewed as the center of international justice, I did say that was slightly redundant, since everybody already knows that. But uh, there truly is an amazing way of making clear that The Hague is the center, and that we are here to make sure that various parts of that uh, incredible history goes on. So it is a great honor, and I'm very glad you asked me to participate, and I'm always very happy to be with you uh, in The Hague or anywhere else. So uh, we have become very dear friends. Uh, I think that this is very much a fitting place uh, to launch this report, and to launch it in the company of so many friends. I do, Ellen explained a bit, but we are we have all known each other for a very long time, and it's a combination of practitioners and academicians. I think that we're able to do that. Abby and I actually taught together at Georgetown. Uh, Ellen and I have known each other through the government, and uh, Ambassador Gambari and I spent, an, there's no way to describe what it's like to be in the Security Council and meet hour after hour after hour. We know each other very, very well and are very good friends, and I was delighted that we could, in fact, co-chair this together, uh, because we have shared so many experiences. Um, I think we know that during the 20th century, despite uh, two world wars and untold human suffering, that we uh, began to understand what is hard to understand is that we now are witnessing an unparalleled advance in terms of some of the horrors that are taking place, having thought that we had defeated uh, fascism and other forms of totalitarian government, and yet we are watching some of the most desperate activities going on um, in the world today. Uh, in the past two decades, uh, we have seen an awful lot of advances in dealing with poverty and technology, but they have brought a lot of their own contradictions and great difficulties in thinking about the fact that large portions of the world are starving and that some of the technolo technological advances have brought us many new problems. Um, there has uh, been um, a rise in violent extremism in ungoverned spaces where the rule of law has collapsed. There's discrimination that continues to threaten the rights of women, children, and minorities worldwide. And humanity's unplanned impact on the global climate, um, the backdrop to a lot of other human achievement, has in fact created some inherent uh, risks and uh, have created a lot of problems. We need, and this is really, as we've looked at the issues, we need better tools to avoid global catastrophe, uh, whether that takes the form of armed conflict or violent floods or market failure. And these tools need to match the scope of the problems. I'm often asked whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And so what we're trying to do is sort out some of the answers, because the problems are global and we need more capable instruments of global governance uh, with different kinds of participants. In addition to the nation states, we also need public, private, and mixed institutions that are in fact designed for the 21st century. As I look around, I'm one of the oldest people, if maybe not actually the oldest person in this room, 70 and over is old, and our institutions are old, and they need to be brought up to date. Um, and so that's why I think that we, in fact, do have a very important job through this commission. Um, I think that what I have liked particularly about the work are the consultations that have taken place uh, that are not just among the commissioners, but with an awful lot of participants in this. 
Uh, we have received support from a number of exceptional organizations and individuals. And I would, um, in this regard, like to express our particular gratitude to the Dutch ambassadors, Rudolf Becknick in Washington and Karel von Ernström in New York. And we have had, and the Commission has had an awful lot of very rich meetings, and as Abby mentioned, a series of online debates um, that have really allowed us to spread our wings and to be able to get more information. Um, I think that uh, these have been mentioned, but just let me explain again kind of the umbrellas on which we are operating. First, under the theme of coping with state fragility and violent conflict, we consider how conflicts within states exploited by international terrorist and criminal organizations have reversed the declining trends in armed violence witnessed at the end of the Cold War. And at the same time, the growing roles of women, civil society organizations, and businesses whose voices are amplified through new communications technologies offer new opportunities um, for effective peace building, governance renewal, and transformational justice. Second, under the heading of climate and people, global systems and local livelihoods, we look at how the steady rise of emissions of greenhouse gases globally uh, are heating up the atmosphere and the oceans, melting polar and glacial um, ice and raising sea levels and ocean acidity to the detriment of sea life and human security alike. And as governments and non-state actors prepare for the December uh, UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, Many are concerned that a, biding, a binding climate agreement uh, continues to seem elusive. And so uh, looking at that is one of the other aspects. And then the third is under the theme of governing the hyperconnected global economy. And we explore how our global economy remains vulnerable to capital flights and illicit financial flows, which divert billions of dollars annually and how uh, connectivity facilitates uh, novel kinds of crime, espionage, and intellectual property and natural resource theft. So we are looking at that. And then we're trying to tie all these things together uh, with our focus on UN and broader global governance reforms. And so these are the issues that we're looking at and advancing reforms that require a strong grasp of what some of the problems are. Uh, and in particular, they are a lack of political will to change, particularly among powerful countries or within entrenched bureaucracies, a poor design and advocacy for specific policy or institutional reform, and third, limited skill and effort invested in sustaining a reform program through to completion. Um, I have just come back from the country where I was born, which doesn't exist anymore, Czechoslovakia, but I've come from the Czech Republic. And I went with my children to Terezin, which was the concentration camp. And it's proof of something that I think we need to deal with. Not only the crimes that took place there, but the lack of international attention to what the problems were. What happened at Terezin, there were Czech Jews that went, but Dutch Jews that were sent there, and the Red Cross was sent to inspect. And they gave it a clean bill of health because they were not prepared to do the job. We need to create groups that are willing to understand what is going on out there, to tell the truth, and to make sure that the international community does something about it. Uh, I only mention that because it is the most recent experience I've had with the importance of having international institutions work and address themselves to the problems that are taking place. And that's what this commission is going to do, and not just have a nice book that sits on the shelf, but spends the next five years between the 70th and 75th anniversary of the United Nations to make sure that things really do work. And so I now would like to uh, introduce my very good friend and co-commissioner, Professor Gambari, who will in fact discuss in more detail some of the reforms. Thank you. Heads of courts and international agencies, members of the diplomatic corps, 
members of the Dutch Parliament and government, my fellow commissioners, Secretary Albright, Mayor Van Atzen, and Dr. Shiva, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Did I leave anybody out? <laughs> I guess not. Uh, good morning, all. And it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you today in the city of The Hague for today's launch of the report of the Commission on Global Justice and Governance. Let me also return Secretary Albright's kind words and express my deep appreciation too for the chance to co-chair this commission with you. Um, it's very necessary, I believe, for co-chairs to work well together. But it's a bonus for co-chairs to actually like one another and to have done so <laughs> for over several decades. And I will never forget, among our many um, uh, times that our paths have crossed, I think it was December 1983, she had a lunch as ambassador of the United States to the five new non-permanent members of the Security Council who are going to come on council to members of council 1994-95. Now you recall that this was a time Bosnia, uh, Rwanda, Mozambique, even South Africa was not yet free. So many crowded agenda. And Marie Albright, who was the only female member of the council at that time, and will be, continue to be 94-95, warned the rest of us, five of us, all men, to say, you know, in the next couple of years, uh, gentlemen, you'll be seeing more of me than your respective wives. <laughs> Which actually happened. And it's both a pleasure <laughs> and a threat. <laughs> uh, so I also want to uh, share my gratitude uh, with the Hague Institute for Global Justice, the Stimson Center, and the many other international partners who have supported this project to date. As I personally observed during the latter half of my professional career, the United Nations has come a long way since the end of the Cold War in terms of investing in human and institutional capabilities for prevention, for mediation, for peacekeeping, and post-conflict uh, peace building. Yet, I think it is important to remem re remember that or be reminded that 1.5 billion citizens of fragile or conflict affect affected countries remain at risk and actually do struggle to meet their basic human needs. Population growth and unplanned urbanization continue and together uh, generate a growing urban youth population with scant prospect for work, which is of course already a source of social and political instability. So in this sense, much more is needed from the United Nations and indeed other global institutions dealing with, for example, uh, security sector reform and the rule of law to economic and social recovery and the promotion of human rights. But as Secretary Albright just alluded to, the United Nations with 193 member states today cannot and should not go it alone, particularly in some of the world's toughest hotspots. The region of Darfur in Sudan, Western Sudan, where I served last as Special Envoy of a joint United Nations African Union peace operation can certainly be classified as a difficult land. And yet, even in such high risk environment, the practical benefits of cooperation have showed through. In recent successful nation run election in my own home country, Nigeria, we also benefited from constructive support in promoting greater transparency as provided by the United Nations the African Union, and many other outside observer groups. And it's important to realize some of the dangers as well as uh, the possibilities, even the recently concluded elections in my own country, Nigeria. Before the elections, there were huge fears that actually Nigeria might cross over the brink and uh, become totally ungovernable, maybe failed or failing states. And at the same time, uh, you have uh, the election went, and people wondered what happened why didn't uh, the, that uh, country collapse? And it shows that a fragile or potentially fragile state can actually be helped to, uh, to gain or regain stability, uh, giving the determination of the people to exercise their basic rights and the international community to assist uh, and accompany the process. The, this commission has examined the four sets of issues introduced by Secretary Albright through the lens of just security representing the intersection of justice and security, 
Both their tensions and mutual complementarities, which we view as critical to understanding and tackling today's global governance threats and challenges. As an analytical tool, it lends fresh insights and greater urgency to tackling other intractable problems across and within borders. The goal of just security is to forge a mutually supportive global system of accountable, fair, and effective governance and sustainable peace. This vision is rooted in long-standing international commitment to human rights, to international law, and the critical role of flexible and evolving multilateral institutions, states, and non-state actors in global governance. Beyond the United Nations and other global institutions, a growing number of regional organizations, including the Association of Southeast Asian States, the European Union, the Union of South American Nations, and of course the African Union are shaping global trends. Equally important are civil society, the business community, municipalities, and the media, each offering unique perspectives and assets in varying size and reach. Another distinguishing feature of this project is its sensitivity to the current international context, where, for example, we believe the Commission's work complements the post-2015 development agenda, which will be presented at this September UN summit and lays out a program that will contribute to meeting Sustainable Development Goal 16 on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies and access to justice for all. We also intend for our recommendations to build upon the recently concluded Global Conference on Cyberspace here in The Hague and the strategic review of UN peacekeeping, as well as to feed into and help shape the UN Climate Conference in Paris uh, later on this year, and the 10-year review of the UN Peace Building Commission now currently underway in New York. With such a convergence of thought and activity, 2015 can be a watershed year with the potential to cross a threshold into a new era of global governance. Finally, we are committed to work with a range of partners, both within and outside governments, to mobilize and sustain the far-reaching, yet practical reform agenda advocated in the report inaugurated here today at the Peace Palace. An effective strategy for reform requires smart coalitions of like-minded states and non-state actors. And in our research and consultations, we have learned from, in particular, the hard-fought successes stories of the, the following. Coalition for the International Criminal Court, we successfully brought it into being. The International Campaign to Ban Line Mines. And last but not the least, the international effort to adopt the responsibility to protect as a global norm. In order to build broad-based coalition and advance many of its reform ideas, the Commission recommends investing in a hybrid approach that taps into the strengths of two major avenues to global governance reform, designed to overcome deep-seated divisions in the international community. First, we describe as reform through parallel tracks, acknowledges what different kinds of multilateral reform negotiation will require different negotiating forum and proceed at different speeds. In doing so, it can facilitate a careful sequencing of reforms based on criteria such as urgency, political feasibility, and cost. Second, marking the UN's 75th anniversary in 2020 with the combination of a multi-stakeholder and formal multilateral negotiation on global institutions and their reforms. We propose a World Conference on Global Institutions, which could serve as a rallying point for smart coalitions and simultaneously generate political momentum for multiple urgent global reforms. In conclusion, the recommendations of the Commission are intended in this 70th anniversary year of the United Nations to encourage a broad-based policy dialogue and an institutional reform agenda aimed actually at 2020, the 75th anniversary commemoration of the United Nations. As Secretary Obras said, we are not going to fold our arms and say, here's the report. Uh, between now and the next five years, we are going to continue consultations, including especially in some regional capitals. Uh, we hope uh, 
strongly Addis Ababa will be one of them because Africa happens to be the, the continent where the challenges of, of this nexus between justice uh, and uh, security uh, occur almost on a daily basis. And then we'll have institutions such as the Economic Commission for Africa, the African Union, the African Development uh, Bank, and an African uh, uh, financial institution that actually works. All of them will be there to engage with us in consultations as a way of moving forward. And it's no accident, in my view, that the uh, International Conference for Financing for Development, which is very critical for the success of the Sustainable Development Goals, will be taking place in Addis, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, next month. So we invite potential partners from around the world, in governments, civil society organizations, the private sector, media, and international organizations to help build and sustain a coalition for progressive global change in pursuit of a vision of justice and security for all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Secretary. Well, thank you, Secretary Albright and Professor Gambari for your illuminating uh, overviews. And you've agreed that we could have a moderated discussion uh, about the report. Secretary Albright, building on your summary of key global governance challenges, further frustrated by inadequate responses by the international community, what would you argue is one common thread running between the reform proposals uh, advanced by the Commission? Well, I think that um, the common thread is that there are solutions if, in fact, we are willing to um, look at what the issues are and which are the groups that can best deal with them. And to be able not to be stuck in silos and decide that just because this is the way we've been doing it, this is the way we'll continue to do it. And I, and I think that um, it's the common thread is a can-do approach, a, a recognition that the problems are interconnected and therefore the organizational approach to it has to be interconnected. And also that we don't necessarily have the right players doing things at the moment. And I mentioned this in my remarks already as some of the, uh, you, the rest of you did, is the system has been based on uh, the nation state. And while there are those who like to talk about the Congress of Vienna, life is a little bit different now. And the bottom line is that there are more players that need to be involved in it. And the real problem internationally is that non-state actors have not been involved. And people think of non-state actors as only terrorists. Non-state actors are all kinds of groups. They're the private sector that plays a very large role multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, civil societies, parliaments that are not at the table. And I think that the common thread here is that we are willing to take a look at things and try to figure out how to bring the non-state actors and others to the table uh, and have them offer their views and participate. The mayor, not just because he's a mayor, but because this was very clear, we talked about the role of cities having international aspects. So that's the common thread, is that we are willing to look at the issues, to redesign the boxes, to have um, get out of the silos and look at common problems together. Uh, Professor Gambari, in your remarks, uh, you talked about Africa as the arena in which a lot of the problems that we identify uh, come together. So, <coughs> excuse me, one of the core themes of our report is to take another look at uh, what to do about weak and fragile states and societies that are emerging from conflict. So I wonder if you could share with us what you found as some of the more useful uh, ideas and recommendations that we've generated about state fragility, violent conflict, and their related problems. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, two, two, two quick points. First, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, uh, many of these uh, countries that appear stable uh, actually have the potential of fragility. At the same time, the fragile uh, countries and societies 
have the opportunity to actually regain stability. In order to do that, uh, we have to design uh, policies uh, and uh, governance that works, uh, uh, policies and, uh, and, uh, and institutions that address the real needs of the many rather than of the few. And in particular, we have to, and the report makes clear, that it's not just about responsibility to protect, very fundamental, but also uh, we are recommending the responsibility to prevent and also the responsibility to rebuild. Now, one of the experiences that I found very unsettling as the head of, at that time, the biggest uh, United Nations African Union Joint Peacekeeping Mission in Darfur, and uh, 30,000, and the most expensive, two billion US dollars a year, I, as the head of this mission, was allowed to spend only four million US dollars on what is called quick impact project. In other words, actually things that address the root causes of conflict, I'm allowed to spend four million US dollars out of a total budget of two billion. What is that? Water, because not enough of it, not well rationalized, uh, uh, unfairly distributed, and yet that was one of the root causes of conflict in Darfur, and yet we have a disproportionate amount of resources spent on addressing it. So the, the kind of recommendations in our report that address the real needs of the people that are forward looking, that uh, serve not the interests of the elite, but the masses of the people, and that emphasize prevention, including specific recommendations for prevention and mediation, not just uh, peacekeeping. Secretary Albright, many people, including people living in the low-lying Benelux uh, countries view climate change as the quintessential global governance challenge of our time. Why does the Commission view climate change as both a global justice issue and a global security concern? And what uh, does it propose in terms of innovating climate governance? Um, I have uh, been often asked in the United States what I consider our greatest national security threat, and I have said climate change. And um, for a number of reasons which you have stated in the question, but also because we are as a society, uh, both nationally and internationally, um, in, I think having difficulty looking at something that is not as immediate as um, nuclear weapons seem to be during the Cold War. It's off somewhere, it's hard to understand. Um, there are discrepancies between what scientists believe and people who still think the Earth is flat. And so there are some serious comprehension issues. And so uh, it doesn't seem like a national security threat or important, but first of all, um, and Ibrahim, you were talking about what was happening in Sudan and Darfur. Some of that was created by climate change, of people of desertification that were pushed out of their lands and then became um, displaced persons within their own country and unwanted as to whether they were farmers or cattle people. But one can go back and blame it on climate change. I do think that issues that we are going to be dealing with in the future have to do with water. Uh, who has access to water? Um, are there droughts? Are there floods? All the issues to do with that, which then specifically lead to issues of food security. Uh, many people in the, I have um, spoken often about the fact that the world seems to be divided between those who um, have nothing to eat and, and countries where diet books are bestsellers. So we have some uh, serious problems in that. And so I think that in many ways, climate change is the biggest threat out there, whether it has to do with security or whether it has to do with humanity, poverty, displaced people, all the different issues. I think that uh, what we have looked at, obviously, the big issues continue to be national legislation, while climate change is obviously an international issue. No one country, no matter how good it is at, as its um, uh, ecological rules, can take care of everything alone. And so we are obviously very supportive of what's going to happen in Paris. 
and then also a number of very technical aspects where there are going uh, suggestions that are quite detailed in our report about how to deal with some of the climate issues in terms of measurement, what kind of um, organizations need to operate, how they work together. But for me, the most important part of this is the recognition that this is one of the huge umbrella issues that have to be dealt with when you asked initially about what the common themes were. There is nothing more common than in terms of how we deal with our common space. Well, I know we're running out of time, but we want to just give a few minutes' attention to the last of the big baskets of topics that our uh, report addresses. We all know that technology has, you know, hugely accelerated processes of globalization in ways that are so beyond the control of nation states and societies. We live in a hyper-connected economy where a lot of the rules of the past uh, just aren't operational anymore. Uh, and we realize that while this connected economic world it creates benefits, it also creates new inequalities. So I, I wanted to give Professor Gambari a chance to just um, identify for, for you all uh, a little bit how we grappled with can global governance improve on anticipating future economic shocks uh, and how did we kind of address those big issues? Thanks, Ellen. The uh, first part of that question, which is uh, this hyperconnected economy and the cyber crimes, the report uh, really addresses uh, this by making some important recommendations on developing global cyber crime centers and uh, making sure that there's coordination and contact and working with Interpol. But at the same time, also uh, to, to enhance, uh, to build a, uh, a pool of uh, experts uh, who, are, uh, who can fight cybercrime and to also link them up with uh, the needs at the global level as well as at the, at the national level. But the second and more important, in my view, part of your question, Ellen, is how to, what are the mechanisms that we can propose or processes that will really minimize some of the uh, uh, major challenges facing the international economic system. Uh, growing inequalities within states and between states. How to minimize uh, the international financial shocks that do not respect uh, borders, uh, and also deal with some of the gap, uh, uh, including, of course, uh, in the, um, the gap in a uh, digital gap between the North and the South. And we propose the uh, G20 Plus, which will be um, uh, a mechanism that will meet every couple of years light coordinating mechanism, uh, but with a small secretariat that will really address the issue of growth, but uh, growth that does not leave anybody behind. Growth that will address inequality within states and between states. So these are some of the ideas that we feel will be relevant in addressing the challenges posed by this hyper-connected uh, global economy and also the, the, the dangers of the, of the cyber crime. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Albright uh, and Professor Gambari. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. William Dirch, the Director of Research for the Commission on Global Security, Justice and Governance, to give the vote of thanks. Well, thank you, Abby. Um, <clears throat> it's my very pleasant duty to thank all of you assembled here at the Peace Palace for attending this event uh, on behalf of the co-chairs, the full commission, the presidents of the partner institutions, and all of us involved in the creation of this report. I want also to extend uh, the deepest thanks of the Hague Institute and the Stimson Center to the commission's co-chairs and to all members of the commission for their wisdom, their engagement, and their commitment to this project and the principles uh, embraced by the Commission report. We'd also like to express our gratitude to everyone consulted for this project, whether as a peer reviewer or a background paper author, an interviewee or a member of an expert's discussion, and also to the project team who made it all happen. Especially you want to acknowledge the uh, contributions to the project of the Bertelsmann Foundation, the Embassy of the Netherlands to the United States, the International Peace Institute, the Frederick Ebert Stiftung, the Municipality of The Hague, uh, the Observer Research Foundation of India, the permanent missions of the United Nations in New York or Brazil, Germany, Japan, and Nigeria, and uh, the Netherlands, and to the Woodrow Wilson House. 
And then finally, special thanks to the Carnegie Foundation at the Peace Palace for supporting today's program. But as you've heard today, the release of this report is not the end of the story. This commission was established to initiate and sustain a policy dialogue on innovations toward a global governance architecture commensurate with today's challenges. We see, that the next, we see the next three to five years as the runway for launching many of the ideas you've heard about today can read about more in the hard copy of the report and can follow on the web as we move toward advocating justice and security together. Now I'd like to invite members of the press to uh, join us on the first floor of the building, uh, just at the head of the stairs and next to the lift uh, for a further press briefing. And uh, thank you all for attending. Um, here's to the future of the world. Bye-bye.